Welcome to Kingdom Theology. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're going to continue to go through Romans chapter 6. Actually, we're trying to work through all the way Romans 6 through 8. Uh, I've already done about four videos. I, I did them a while back, but I just loaded them up recently, and I'm going to continue on that series. I originally started this series uh, with, especially with the so-called free grace movement in mind. Um, especially there is a teaching that floats around in the free grace movement that because our uh, spirit has been justified, no matter what our flesh does, then it cannot contaminate our justified spirit. Our spirit can't sin. And so it's kind of a, a semi-gnostic way of thinking. And so I wanted to go through this passage because a lot of us, you know, as we come to Christ and we begin to read the scriptures, a lot of things that are in the scriptures, things like what's the flesh, what's walking according to the spirit, you know, what's the difference between faith and works? And, you know, we're going to, we're justified through faith, but we're, you, we've got eternal, or that we're going to be judged by our works. And so these things become confusing in our mind. And so really over the last 30 years as a believer, you know, I've really, these are the questions that are on my mind. And so it's important that we are able to read the scripture and understand the logic of what's being said and how Paul is using certain terminology so that we don't fall into things like, you know, that semi-gnostic, a version of the free grace movement. So we're just going to go through. I don't have any notes, so we're just kind of going to walk through this, and I hope you find it helpful. Uh, we're going to start in verse 15. Now, up to up till now, in, in chapter 6, 1 through 14, or yeah, 1 through 14, he's just been saying that whenever we identify with Christ, we identify with his death to sin and his life, uh, his new life before God. Then he goes on, um, and so in verse 11, likewise, you also consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in, in its lust. And so as we looked at in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 13, I believe verse 14, it says, so put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to give it, give it its, uh, lust and its desire. So we don't give the flesh what it wants. Instead, we give uh, the spirit what he leads us to do. And when we talk about what the lust of the flesh is, you know, a good analogy to be able to help us to understand this is, you know, if you take the picture of the Israelites when they were living in Egypt, they were not uh, Egyptians, but they lived there for 400 years. And in that time, they began to get a taste for the things of Egypt. Just like we lived before we knew Christ, we got a taste of the things of the world. And so we kind of, like, like the Israelites, they kind of adopted Egyptian culture with inside of them. So when they left out of Egypt and they were traveling around in the wilderness with Moses, they began to cry out and complain, we want the food that we had back in Egypt. And so the same thing, whenever we come into Christ and we have the Spirit of God and He's leading us and we're walking with Him, that doesn't mean that there's nothing left of that old culture with inside of us that tries to pull us back. Now, we, we're the ones that are the ones that are, are, are responsible either to give the lust what it wants, which leads to death, or to submit ourselves to the Spirit of God. As it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, it says, uh, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so this is the Christian life, that we are by the power of the Holy Spirit submitting to Him, walking in obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ, not perfectly, but by the grace of God, we're walking in that direction. We're sowing to the Spirit, not sowing to the flesh. So that's kind of what we've been covering up till now. And starting in verse 15, we're just going to walk through here. Uh, verse 15, what then? Shall we, shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. So this brings up this idea that in the Old Testament, they were under law. And they had to do it. And many people have the idea that somehow in the Old Testament, they were earning their way to heaven. Even though in the Old Testament, they didn't even mention heaven. It wasn't talked about in the law of Moses. It was said, if you obey the law in the land, then you'll stay in the land. If you disobey it, you'll get kicked out of the land. It was a national covenant given to them. It wasn't, if you obey the law of Moses and don't eat pork and keep the Sabbath days, then you'll go to heaven. If not, you'll go to hell. No, that is a strange understanding of the law of Moses. It was a, it was a law that was given to the nation of Israel. It was a natural and, and earthly law that had not only... Uh, many earthly commandments like what you eat and what you taste and what you wear, all those type of things, but it also had uh, 
uh, earthly promises. You'll be blessed in your fields, you'll be blessed in having many children, or you'll be cursed and, not, and your wife will be barren, you'll get kicked out of the land of Israel, all these things, it was a natural thing. So living under the law was never them trying to somehow earn eternal life, but they were in a covenant and they were supposed to walk in that as the law of the land. And if they did live in rebellion to it, like murder or adultery or many things like that, then they would be put to death, they would be stoned to death because that was the law of the land. So here it says, what shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? In other words, okay, they were under something. They were under obligation to obey law, but we're under grace. That means we're forgiven. No matter what happens, we're going to go to heaven. That's a misunderstanding of grace. Grace is not just the forgiveness of God, but it's also the empowering, uh, the empowering of God to give us grace, to give us strength, ability to overcome sin. We have the Spirit of God. Men that are without the Spirit of God have only one option. They can follow after their own desires, their own wisdom, their own ways, which are influenced greatly by the world with its values and with its you know, desires. And so they are always going to walk away from God. But somebody who has been born again, has received the Spirit of God, then they can choose either to walk according to the flesh the old way, or they can walk according to the Spirit. And so grace, uh, you know, we mentioned this in the last video, but let's go and flip over to Titus to see that this is what grace is about in the Bible. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 here. 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so what is this grace of God and what does it do? Verse 12, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in godliness in this present world, as we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a special people zealous for good works. So, he redeemed us from lawlessness. So, from walking after our own desires and our own flesh, we were redeemed. Even in the Old Testament, though they had the law of Moses, it was written on stone. It says, it says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that the law was written on stone. And because it was written on stone and not written on their heart, though they saw the law, though they acknowledged that it was good to follow the law, they had not within themselves the ability to do it because their desires were much closer to them than the law. The law was far away. They saw that it was good, but close within them was the desires of their flesh and their mind. And so those were the things that they followed after. And so they were, they were given over to lawlessness. This is why in the Old Covenant law, in order to preserve the people of Israel, God gave them a law that kept them separate from all the other nations so they wouldn't be too corrupted too quickly so that in, in due season, Christ could come and bring salvation. And this salvation, the grace of God, teaches us to deny worldly lusts and ungodliness. Instead, by the Holy Spirit, we have living within us, we're redeemed from lawlessness and purify for himself a special people zealous of good works. So what were we saved from? We were saved from lawlessness. We were saved from rebellion against God, from having to be bound to only follow after our own desires and our own wisdom. And now we've been reconciled to God, no longer alienated from God, but now the Spirit of God dwells within us so that we can walk with God and we can follow His ways and we can do what's pleasing to Him. This is why as a Christian, as a non-Christian, you know, our, our conscience, was not, conscience was not very guilty very often. It was only in some moments of time where we would feel guilty. But whenever the Spirit of God comes to live in it, we always have the Spirit of God there searching our heart and trying us, always telling us, no, this is the way, not this way. And so we often, whenever we start going astray, the Spirit of God will come to convict our conscience of sin so that we can walk in the right way. But without the Spirit of God, we don't see those things so clearly, and so we walk after our own desires, not after according to the way of God. But now the law of God is written in our hearts by the Spirit of God and continually written in our hearts day by day as he leads us step by step into the eternal kingdom. So we have been redeemed from lawlessness. So going back to Romans 6, where it says, uh, what sh then shall we say, shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. So... Since we're not under law, should we now go ahead and be lawless? No, that doesn't make any sense. By grace, we've been redeemed from lawlessness so that now we can walk in submission to God's law. 
Now, as we're going to go on, as we get to chapter 7, we're going to see we're not under the law of Moses, and that's what Paul's saying here is we're not under that law, that law that's written on stone, but we are under the law of Jesus Christ that's written in our heart by the Spirit of God, which is summed up in love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, shall we... Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? God forbid. We've been redeemed from lawlessness by the grace of God that teaches us to turn from wickedness. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? So, as I mentioned just now, somebody without the Spirit of God has no choice. They are bound to their own desires and their own wisdom, their own their own knowledge, their own ways. They are alone, alienated from God. They are lost in the world and they are bound to sin and their own desires. But after coming to Christ, receiving the Spirit of God, now we have a choice to make. Are we going to submit to the Spirit or are we going to submit to the lust of the flesh? Okay, so here he says, you are slaves to whom you obey. Okay, so are we going to be slaves to sin by serving the flesh or slaves to God by following the Spirit? So it says, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Okay, this is really important for us to understand because many people have got the idea in their mind that to be righteous is just something we have positionally. That because we believed in Jesus, now our status before God is righteous. You know, we're justified, counted righteous before God, and it doesn't matter what we do that God always sees us as righteous in our status. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the New Testament teaches. It says, whether of sin leading to death. So if we follow sin, if we serve sin, if we obey sin, sinful desires and wickedness, if we serve sin, then that leads to death. That leads to uh, separation from God. It leads to eternal hell. It leads to danger and death. Okay, Or of obedience leading to righteousness. But when we obey Jesus Christ, we obey his commands, trusting in him, loving him, walking in obedience and submission to him by the power of the Holy Spirit, this leads to righteousness. Okay, so let's go ahead and flip to 1 John chapter 3 because this sounds so strange to us if we have this mindset that everything, that all of salvation is just about justification. Okay, in the, if somebody is lost, separated from God, and the, the gospel comes to them, the Spirit of God comes and convicts them, and they're called to repent and to trust in Jesus Christ, what do they need to do to be made in right standing with God? What do they need to do? What do they need to fix and change about their life before they can be in right standing with God? The answer is they need to repent, turn from rebellion in their heart, and trust in Jesus Christ. They don't have to fix all the mess that they've made throughout their life. They don't have to go back and correct every mistake that they've made and they've got to do a lot of good works first to earn some status with God. No, when they turn from their rebellion, trust in Jesus Christ, then they are immediately made righteous. They're accepted, welcomed, justified by God, counted as righteous. They are then in right standing with God and adopted as God's children, okay? But now, after they've been adopted as God's children and they're walking with Christ and they're standing... They need to continue to walk in faith. And this faith is a faith that works through love, as it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, that faith works through love. That is, a living faith that moves us to action and obedience to Jesus Christ and his command, which is to love God and to love others. And so, when we go to 1 John chapter 3, let's see, verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, we read it in Titus, that he came to... Uh, the, the grace of God came bringing salvation, turning us away from lawlessness, redeeming us from lawlessness so that we'd be zealous for good works. We read it again here, that the Son of God, the purpose of the Son of God was revealed, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What works of the devil? Sin. And so here in this passage it says, let no one deceive you by telling you, as long as you believed one time in the gospel, as long as you believed that Jesus died and rose again for you and you prayed a sinner's prayer and invited Jesus into your heart, then you're righteous and everything is okay. No. It says, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous. 
just as Christ is righteousness. We must have a living faith. As James says it, can faith that has no works save someone? No, that's a dead faith, and that kind of faith can save no one. The kind of faith that saves is the one that clings to Jesus Christ, that abides in the vine, stays close to him, and clings to him that loves him because Jesus loved us first and died for us, so then we have a love for him. And Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. He who does not love me does not obey my commandments. And so this love, this faith towards Jesus Christ moves us to action. And this is how we walk in right standing with God, because we walk in a living faith that works through love. Little children, that no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. So this is clear going back to Romans chapter 6. So it says, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So are we walking in righteousness, submitting to Jesus, not perfectly? Uh, We know if we flipped over 1 John chapter 2. Verse, verse 1 through 4 is a good place for you to go to to get the balance of this. Okay, let's go ahead and flip there. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. So this is John writing. He says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you do not sin. So what is the, what is the goal of the Christian life? To not live lawless, to not walk in the, the, the works of the devil, which is sin, But the goal is, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you do not sin. Okay, this is what he is urging them to do. So this means that they can walk in righteousness. Okay, so that would, some would then get nervous. Okay, that means that I've got to live in perfection because I'm expected to live in perfection and and all these kind of things. And it goes on and says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay? So we see a balance here. We see that, yes, God calls us to live righteously, but he doesn't demand perfection. Instead, he has prepared a sacrifice, his son on a cross, that is now risen to the right hand of God and is presenting that perfect, perfect sacrifice before the Father, and he is able to save to the uttermost all that come to God through him. This is in Hebrews chapter 7, I believe verse 23, maybe 25. And so Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. He is the Savior. Now, this is something important. A lot of times people think, because here, look what it says. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. A lot of times people will say, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. That was the atonement for our sins. And as long as I believe in that atonement, I believe that on that day my sins were paid for, then all my sins are taken away. That's not the biblical understanding. The biblical understanding is that yes, on that day Jesus died for the sins. He tasted death for all men. But if he died and stayed dead, it would profit no one but he rose from the dead because he was obedient to the Father. Then he's seated at the right hand of God, and he's seated at the right hand of God so that all that come to him, all that come to that throne of grace, seeking mercy, seeking help in time of need, those that come will receive mercy and grace. But we must come. We can't live our own life in our own rebellion, in our own wickedness, apart from Christ, without living faith, and expect that, oh, because I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that my sins are forgiven. No, Jesus Christ on the cross, listen to this, Jesus Christ dying on the cross does not save you. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, then rising again, being seated at the right hand of God, calling us to himself, and when we come to him and we plead with him, he saves us. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We must come to Jesus Christ, not just come to a concept or an idea or a theology about his atonement. We must come to the living Savior that's risen at the right hand of God. So we see, I'm writing these things to you, don't sin, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, you're not expected perfection. perfection. There is a sacrifice and there is a high priest that's there making intercession for you. So, okay, so well, I've got a sacrifice and a high priest, all is good. Doesn't matter if I sin or not. No, then it goes on in verse three. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So we see that this balance Okay, I'm writing these things, don't sin. If you do sin, doesn't mean that you're cast away from God. But if you say that you know God and that you're walking with Jesus Christ, but you don't live in obedience to his commandments, then 
you're lying. You're not telling the truth. And so we'd say, well, does that mean perfect obedience? Of course, we just learned that it doesn't mean perfect obedience. If it meant perfect obedience, then why did, Paul, why did John say, but if anyone sins? So it's not talking about perfection, but it's also not talking about license and rebellion, that as long as you believe in Jesus, no matter what you do, that your eternal consequences, there's going to be no eternal consequences. Maybe you'll lose out in some millennial kingdom rewards, but you'll never go to hell. That's not true. On the day of judgment, those that are lawless, Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says, I never knew you. What does it mean, I never knew you? It means I'm disowning you. In, in, you know, in our culture, in Western culture, American culture, the thought of disowning your child is not acceptable. But in Middle Eastern culture, there was the idea that, look, if my son shames me, if he dishonors our family, then I will disown him. I'll say, I don't know your name. You are dead to me. You are no longer part of this family. I don't know you. I never knew you. You are not connected with me. Okay? So we need to take a biblical model. A lot of those that, a lot of times people will, in this idea of once saved, always saved, will say, look, uh, would you ever get rid of your son? You know, would you ever abandon your son if he became your son? If he was your son, would you ever disown him? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe it kind of depends on what the situation was. But in our culture and generally, the answer would be no. But in biblical culture, the answer is not always no. Plus, in Scripture, when it says that we're children of God, it also says many other things. We're servants of God. We're slaves of God. It says that we are the temple of God. It says, uh, it says many things about us. So just saying that we are children of God is not everything that we are to God. And also, if we are children of God, God can disown a people that walk in lawlessness because he redeemed a people that would be zealous for good works. He redeemed us from lawlessness. So if we go back into sin and rebellion, then we are saying we don't want anything to do with you. Just like the prodigal son, uh, the, the, the father didn't want the son to leave. The father loved the son, wanted him to stay there. There was everything that he needed for the son was with the father. But when the son left, when the son walked away, then he was dying, he was starving. Even though his father had plenty, he was starving because the father didn't go with him into sin. The father didn't go with him into the pigsty. He didn't go with him. He was left out there to die. But when he turned back, when he came back to the father, then once again, he had everything that he needed. Life and salvation and eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. If we have Jesus Christ, we're walking with him. We're clinging to him. As a, a branch clings to the vine, then we have life. But if we pull away from him, we are good for nothing but to be cast into the fire. So let's flip back over here to Romans chapter 6. So verse 17. But thanks be to God, for you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and having been freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. So thanks be to God that when the gospel came to you, Jesus said this, he who sins is a slave to sin and a slave will never enter the father's house. Okay, so those that are living in sin, living in rebellion, they are on their way to death and destruction. They are not going to enter the father's house. They're not going to have, you know, part in the kingdom of God. Okay, but thanks to be to God, for you were slaves of sin, but you obeyed the, from the heart that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. In other words, when you repented and turned to Jesus Christ and you were given the way, what, is to be, what does it mean to make a disciple? Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In other words, I'm the king, I'm the Lord, I'm the master. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means that they turn to me, that they turn away from the world and they come to me. Okay, And then what? And then teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. So, what is this form of teaching? It was that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we need to walk in his ways, that we need to be light, we need to be salt, we need to walk in obedience to the teachings of Jesus Christ by the power of his spirit, not in perfection, but by the grace of God that we're freed from bondage because now we know God. So, but thanks be to God for you were slaves of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. Obeyed, it's something that we do. This is why we're gonna be judged on the last day. It's not because, uh, you, know, you know, in the Calvinist circles, the idea is that, well, God will make, us make it happen. God will make sure that we obey. No, we're going to be judged because we must choose to obey. We say, well, that's earning our salvation. According to Scripture, 
That is not earning salvation. That is simply meeting the conditions that God requires. This is why he is an impartial judge, because he's going to judge men according to whether they have submitted to his truth or whether they have not obeyed the gospel. And so we need to understand that the scripture is very clear, that we obeyed from the heart this form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Now, those in Calvinist circles, you know, are going to be much, uh, much more uh, orthodox or much uh, safer doctrine than those in the free grace camp because they're going to say, yes, we must obey. Now, they have the philosophy that behind it that says there's determinism that God is going to cause them. You know, uh, you know you, he's going to make sure that they obey, make sure that they endure, make sure that they endure to the end, that they continue to believe. Okay, but so that's some strange philosophy. But nonetheless, it's safer the fact that they understand that Christians must live holy and godly lives. So this, this is why for me, uh, though I have many videos on this channel that are against Calvinist teaching because there's many unorthodox things in Calvinist teaching, I am by no means saying that uh, those that walk according to Calvinism are not Christian. Uh, I would even go as far as say those that are in the free grace camp are not necessarily un unsaved for sure because there are many that are godly, clinging to Christ, trusting in Christ, walking with him. But it's a dangerous doctrine that tells people and if we teach people that no matter what you do, no matter how you live, that you're going to inherit eternal life no matter what because you believed one time, that is, that's some dangerous business. But Calvinists do not do that. So I want to be clear about that. But, okay, verse eight, 18, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So what does it mean that they became slaves of righteousness? Was it because that now just by you know, God's decree, they're going to live righteously? No, because they're going to continue to give themselves to obedience to righteousness. That obedience leads to righteousness. Let's move on here in verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you have yielded your members to, as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity, even so now yield your members as slaves to righteousness unto holiness. So here, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. He's, uh, he's saying, I'm going to give you, like, I'm, I'm trying to put this in a very human way. I'm trying to make it an analogy for you that in the same way that you obey one master and disobey another, in the same way you need to obey righteousness and not obey sin. And so he's giving this analogy. For just as you have yielded your members, that's your, bodily, your, your bodily members, your hand, your eyes, your mind, all these things, if you yield everything that you have control over, that just as you have yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity. So, what is the number one judgment, the, real, the, the wrath of God upon sin? A lot of times people will think, well, the wrath of God is whenever there's a tsunami or there's an earthquake or there's a tornado or some sort of natural event or somebody gets in a car accident and they realize how, you know, how sinful of life they've been living and how, danger, how, how dangerous their life really is. Okay, no, that's called the grace of God. That's called uh, God getting attention because that's God still reaching out even though he might... Uh, he's bringing judgment, but his judgment is meant to lead us to repentance. In his kindness, he's leading us to repentance, even when he brings disaster in our life. This is discipline, and God does this not only with his children, but he's gracious to do it even with the nations. That sometimes he will, you know, bring a great disaster on a nation, and though many die in that, but others will come to Christ because of it. But what is the greatest, what is the greatest form of wrath? We see it back here in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and, and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. For what was no, to be known about God is clear to them since God has shown it to them. The invisible things about him, his in, eternal power and deity, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world and are understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse. So what's the wrath of God that's being revealed? He goes on to say because although they knew God, they did not glorify him or give thanks to him as God, but became futile in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image of made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So they knew who God was, but in their rebellion, they suppressed the truth and they worshiped idols instead. And so here's the wrath. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves. 
Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged the natural function for what is against nature. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not proper. The judgment and the wrath of God, when God is very serious about judging someone, he hands them over to their own desires. We see this also if we flip over to, uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Here. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's see here. Start in verse ten, and with all deception, or the start in verse nine. Even him whose coming is in accordance with working of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So this is uh, the the son of perdition. Okay. Verse 10, and with all deception of unrighteousness among those who perish because they did not receive the love for the truth that they might be saved. So there's this great deception coming of, of all kinds of false signs and wonders. And it's because people didn't love the truth, but instead they loved unrighteousness. Verse 11, I think verse 11, I can't read here. Okay, therefore, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this is a general principle of Scripture. We see this if we go back to Ezekiel. It talks about when if you come to the, the false prophets with idols in your heart, that means things you desire to hear and that you want to hear, that you have itching ears, and you come to these false prophets, then God would send a lying spirit into the mouth of the false prophets to speak to the idols in your hearts. In other words, tell you what you want to hear. So a lot of times whenever we look around in the church world today and we see all kind of false teaching, we see, you know, extreme forms of the, you know, uh, Hebraic roots, we see extreme forms of the the free grace movement, we see all kinds of crazy stuff going on, and we say, how could somebody be fall into these so hard? Now, again, I'm not saying that everybody that you know has some ideas of free grace or some ideas of Hebraic roots are necessarily not Christian, but whenever they go all the way in, when they start making videos of every other Christian and put six six sex on their forehead and they curse everybody else and they say that they are the you know the the very few remnant and and they have this sectarian mindset and they judge everybody who doesn't keep Sabbath and everybody who doesn't eat kosher food and all these things and they stand themselves up. What's happening? This is a delusion by God. This is judgment by God. Now, we can still pray for those people that God in his mercy would reach out to them, that he would humble them, uh, you know, and show them that they are being foolish, that they are completely deceived and in delusion because they did not receive the truth. So this is a dangerous thing. Going back to Romans chapter 6, this is the danger. It says here uh, in verse 19, I speak with human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity, leading to more iniquity. Sin, the judgment for sin is sin, more sin and more sin. That God hands us over to those wicked desires so that we do what is, is, is shameful, so that we, we humble ourselves, we become like beasts and we follow after wickedness, whether it be the wickedness of antichrist doctrine or whether it be the wickedness of, of fleshly and carnal living but that sin leads to sin just like deception leads to more deception okay iniquity leading to more iniquity even so now so that's how you were you were lost in the world and sin just led to more sin which led to more sin you were getting more and more corrupt but now in the kingdom of god we have the spirit of god and we go from glory to glory we're being transformed into the image of the lord okay that says in in first second corinthians chapter Chapter 3 says, Even so now yield your members as slaves to righteousness unto holiness. So now we're going to obey righteousness. We're going to obey what is pleasing to God, obey the Spirit of God, obey the commands of Jesus Christ. We're going to do it willingly. It's not something that God is going to make happen. God works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. But then we have to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. So God works in us, giving a desire, leading us, influencing us in a certain direction by his spirit, leading us to the truth, leading us to righteousness, but we have to obey. We have to submit to the spirit of God and put sin to death. So members of slaves to righteousness unto holiness. So obedience leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads to holiness. And where does that start? That starts with us choosing to submit to obedience from the heart, obeying the form of teaching that we were taught. 
leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads to holiness. It's important for us to see this is what Paul is talking about. He's not speaking about, you know, some sort of a magical sanctification that just happens without, you know, our willingness to be involved. And he's not saying that, well, no matter what you do, it's okay. Yeah, you can live according to the flesh, but you're still going to live eternally in heaven. No, he says it leads to death. So we need to understand Paul's thinking. It goes on in verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. So now we can be free from sin because we no longer submit to sin. We no longer submit to unrighteousness, but we submit to righteousness. Just like Jesus said about those that love money, either you're going to serve one, you're going to serve money, or you're going to serve God. If you serve money, you can't serve God. And if you serve God, you can't serve money. In the same way, if you're walking in righteousness, you can't walk in sin. And if you're walking in sin, you can't walk in righteousness. You're going to be slave to the one whom you obey, whether slaves of righteousness or slaves of sin. But then it says this in verse 22, and this is kind of a crescendo moment here in this chapter. This is kind of leading to a conclusion, and I want us to see this because it's very important. We often jump over to verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we ignore the rest of the chapter. We ignore what everything that he said up to this point. So how is verse 23 usually interpreted? It's usually used in something like the Romans Road kind of an evangelism experience where somebody's saying like, look, if you believe on Jesus, then you will receive the gift of eternal life. And it, you have already sinned, and so the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Just believe on him, and then you'll have eternal life. You, no matter what, you'll, you'll, you'll have eternal life. And the idea is that salvation is just a one-time moment of transaction. I believed, and now I've got eternal life, and nothing can take it away from me. That's not how it works. Actually, what happens is whenever we repent and trust in Jesus Christ, we're reconciled to God, and in Jesus Christ, we're given eternal life. That is, eternal life is in Jesus Christ, and he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So when we turn to God through Jesus Christ, we have eternal life in Jesus. As we cling to him, we have eternal life in him. Let's, let's quickly uh, go ahead and jump there. It's a passage I often go to, which is also used by those in the so-called free grace movement. 1 John chapter 5, it's very important for us to understand this concept, for us to be able to understand how salvation, how uh, transformation works in our life, starting in verse 11. Okay, uh, or let's start in verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he does not believe the testimony that God gave us about his Son. Okay, so through faith. Through faith in what God has said. Verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Okay, so many in the so-called free grace camp will say, see, I, I've got eternal life. I, I already had it. I believe the testimony. I have it. I believed and I received it and I've got it. It's mine. That's not what the passage says. It goes on. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Eternal life is in Jesus Christ because he's risen from the dead and he will die no more. He's seated at the right hand of God and eternal life is in him. And we, as long as we cling to him, we have the hope and the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not through ourselves. It's not like God just handed us eternal life and now we can walk away from him and do whatever we wish and we can still have eternal life. No, just like the prodigal son, when he walks away from the father, all that money that was given to him all just disappeared and it, it was no use to him. The only way to have life is to go back to the father. And the only way to have life is through a living faith in Jesus Christ. We're clinging to him and abiding in the vine. So this is eternal life. And and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So we need to understand as we go back to Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. If we're walking in a rebellion to God, if we're living in sin, as it said in verse 16, do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So if somebody is walking in sin, they are slaves to sin. Whoever sins, Jesus said, is a slave to sin because they are obeying sin and they are, will never enter the Father's house. It says in Romans or in John chapter 8, Jesus said that. So a slave is whoever sins is a slave to sin and will never enter the Father's house. If you are Living in sin, 
you are a slave to sin and the wages of sin or whether of sin leading to death. Sin leads to death, just as it says in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. It doesn't mean, well, you were a sinner and, and you were going to die, but now you believed in Jesus and you're going to go to heaven. And that's, that's all there is to it. No, you were a slave to lawlessness, but Jesus has redeemed you from lawlessness and made you somebody that's zealous for good works instead of zealous for sin. Real quickly, let's jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We want to see this here. Okay, so verse 7 says, um, actually, let's start in verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So faith is a walk. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, not that they believed one time, but that we walk by faith. Instead, I say that we are confident and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So whether present or absent, we labor that we may be accepted by him. Okay. Why are we laboring to be accepted? Why are we continuing to walk in a living faith that trusts and obeys Jesus Christ? Because Hebrews 5, 9 says he's the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Verse 9 or verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive his recompense in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The scriptures are very clear. We are going to be judged according to our works. That is what the New Testament says over and over and over again. And so we need to understand that we need to be walking in righteousness. He, don't let anybody deceive you and say that you're righteous, but you're not practicing righteousness. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness just as Jesus Christ is righteous. Whoever practices sin is of the devil, he's a slave to sin, and will never enter the Father's house. So if we jump over to, let's see, verse uh, 14. For the love of Christ constrains us because we judge that if one died for all, then all died. Now this is important. Why did he die for us? A lot of times the idea is Jesus died for us on the cross so that we can go to heaven. We've already read that he redeemed us from lawlessness, that the grace of God teaches us to turn from ungodliness. But here, look what we read here. And he died for all that those who live should know from should not from now on live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Jesus died to create a people that would be zealous for good works, that would be redeemed from lawlessness. Okay, jump back over to Romans chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death, in verse 23. Okay, so if we obey unrighteousness, we obey, obey sin, we're slaves to sin, we're not going to enter the Father's house, this is all very clear, okay? But then it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so the idea is, well, yeah, but I believed, so I already have eternal life. It's eternal, I can't be taken away. Yes, it's eternal, and that eternal life is in Jesus Christ. And it's eternally in him, and if we walk away from him, we walk away from that eternal life. So when it says it's eternal, we understand it's in Jesus Christ. We're waiting for the hope of the resurrection of the dead through Jesus Christ. So our hope is in Jesus Christ and we're clinging to him. But let's jump back to verse 22 because this is what we never face before we face verse 23, which is kind of a conclusion to what he's been saying all the way throughout in Romans 6. But now, having been freed from sin, because we no longer serve sin, we no longer are give our yield our members as slaves to sin but now having been freed from sin and having become slaves of god so now we're yielding our members to god we're serving god with our life not serving sin you have fruit unto holiness so remember it said that through obedience obedience leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to holiness so the fruit, you have fruit unto holiness by being slaves of god by presenting ourselves slaves to god you have fruit unto holiness and the end is eternal life. So we obey Christ because he is the Savior. We're clinging to him. He's the one at the right hand of God that's able to save those that come to him. So we come to him trembling before him as the Lord of heaven and earth, trusting that he is gracious to us, shows us mercy, shows us compassion, gives us grace and help to turn us away from wickedness, to redeem us from lawlessness. And then we cling to him like a, a branch clings to the vine so that we can bear fruit. Okay? So, but now having been freed from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit unto holiness. So clinging to the vine, we get the fruit of holiness. And what's the end of that? What's the result of holiness? Because without holiness, no man will see the Lord, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, I believe. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Let's go ahead and turn there. 
Hebrews chapter 12, because this is such a, a stronghold in people's mind. Even if we haven't fallen into free grace, we've been so influenced to think that our choices, to think that our behavior, our obedience is a work and something that the scripture is saying, no, 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 don't, don't worry about works, meaning don't worry about obedience to Jesus. No, no, that, that doesn't matter, but it does matter. Uh, let's see, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's see if I can, yes, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Watching diligently so that no one falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble and many become defiled lest there be any sexually immoral or profane person of, like Esau who for a morsel of food sold his birthright for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing he was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it diligently with tears okay so I, I read the whole context so we see that this holiness is not about positional holiness it's not just about what we believed and now in God's eyes we're holy no we're walking in holiness the fruit of holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Seeing the Lord is not just going to the millennial kingdom. Seeing the Lord means eternal life. The pure in heart shall see God. Okay, and we go back to Romans chapter 6. But now having been freed from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit unto holiness. And the end, the result of that is eternal life. And then the conclusion is the summary of chapter 6, which is for the wages of sin is death. If we live in sin, if we walk in according in rebellion against God, then we are slaves to sin and will never enter the Father's house. We will die and perish under the wrath of God. Okay? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If we turn to him, cling to him, hold to him, and abide in him, then he will bear fruit through our lives, holiness will come in our lives, and we will inherit eternal life through him, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the one that's risen at the right hand of God, making intercession, we're holding on to him. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ. It is not in a transaction that we made by believing some concepts many years ago. It's by us today clinging to Jesus Christ. As it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as workers together with God, we ask you not to receive the grace of God in vain. How could we receive the grace of God in vain? It means that we received it, but then we don't walk in it. We waste it. Just like the men who they received talents from the master, but then they, he went and buried it in the sand and he did not put it into practice. He received it in vain. And it goes on. For he who says, in an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Look, now is the accepted time. Look, now is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow that we're going to get saved. No, we need to walk with, in salvation to, right now today. But it's also not yesterday. This passage is saying, don't think that because you received grace in the past that you're still walking in the grace of God today. If you bury it in the sand and you don't put it into practice and you don't grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, if you don't, as it says in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you don't increase in the character and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you walk according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Uh, let's close by looking at Galatians and see the same thing is summed up. What, what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 6 is summed up in here in, let's see, in, in Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7, do not be deceived. Okay, Don't let anybody deceive you that just because you believed one time that you're righteous in God's eyes and you're going to heaven no matter what. Don't believe it. It's not true. It's not biblical. It's not orthodox. It's not godly. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This is not talking about your offering, that if you give a lot in the offering, you're going to get it back. It's, it's talking about this. Verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. That is death. That if we walk upon the flesh, we will die. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So I'm not sure whether we're going to continue on uh, uh, in... In future videos going through Romans chapter 7 and 8, uh, I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, Romans chapter 7 is really important to go through. So, so God willing, I'll go through that. But I hope that at least at this point in this, these, these, this is the fifth video, I think, in this small series, that you've been able to come to an understanding of what it means when it says in verse 23, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's not some transaction. It's through him, through the living Christ, that we cling to him, we submit to him, we walk in a living faith.
If this has been helpful to you, go ahead and like and uh, share it with other people so that the algorithm will pick that up, pick up on that so more people can see it. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe if you find this useful on this channel. We just tried to go through and look at the scriptures from a very practical way and see that how it applies to us. We want to understand concepts of theology that are not just made up in high philosophy, but something that can be worked down to where we're walking in the kingdom of God. We're submitting to the king. We're rejoicing in the salvation that we have in the king and so if that interests you and you you need to grow in those things then i encourage you to go ahead and subscribe uh we try to make at least three videos a week on this channel uh, things pretty soon are going to get a little bit more busy so we'll try to keep up to at least three but a lot of times we're making it almost daily so hope this has been helpful to you god bless